to show me the queries. I hope you like queries as much as I do because we're going to look at a lot of queries today. And so it's a Tableau conference, so we have to start with the visualization. <clears throat> Here we have airline name on the rows and an aggregate of some kind of minute delay. It looks like maybe a rival delay on columns. And I have a filter on airline name, and I've selected five of those. And those airline names are ordered, starting with Delta, to. Uh, well, actually ordered by uh, their delay, right? Um, so the question is, how does that viz turn into this SQL statement? And that is the main point of this talk, but we're going to look at a lot of other use cases for queries, queries as well. So I have select of airline name and aggregate from an extract. That's, that's what this is working on. I've got a where clause with an in list and a group by on airline name. And it has something to do with these logical operator trees, which are similar to relational algebra. And of course, these are relational data sources for the most part, so it's about the relational model. And I'm going to try to explain how we go from that viz to SQL using these operator trees. So this is show me the queries. This is the second session. I assume no one attended the first session. And there are some interesting related sessions, which of course you'll have to uh, look at after the fact. Uh, I'm going to be using uh, one tool in particular, which is the Tableau Log Viewer. If you'd like more information or more demos of that, then I would suggest this middle talk, Understanding Tableau Queries, Techniques, and Tools to Use. Also at the end of the talk, I have a resources slide which has links to the Tableau Log Viewer, which is an open source project in Tableau's GitHub. Um, and the visualizations of the logical queries that you see are using another open source project that's used as a library in the Tableau Log Viewer. And for me, that was one of the first research projects I worked on at Tableau. So I'm a research scientist in Tableau's small research team. I'm in Palo Alto. And my background is research and development and query processing. So I've kind of moved in and out of development and research over the years. Uh, probably the thing that I worked on that you might most be familiar with is I worked at a company called Paracel, and Paracel ultimately became Redshift on uh, AWS. Why, why did I join Tableau? Well, Tableau has this amazing ecosystem of query processing, right? But not only that, it has its own user interface. And I never worked it anywhere I always worked in back-end databases, and you just supported all these different users and all these different use cases. So it's really interesting to work at a place where we, for the most part, the user interface belongs to Tableau. So the agenda for this talk is how a visualization becomes a query. What do we mean by a query? Uh, let's, took it, let's take a look at the Tableau query, what I call the ecosystem of queries in Tableau. It's more than just the viz and that SQL. It's the stuff in between. It's the stuff that's going on in the data sources. Let's look at all of that together as much as we can. And then I'm going to show you a lot of queries. Very quickly, a lot of queries. So how does a visualization become a query? Here's that viz I already explained. And here's that SQL statement. Somehow we got there. And of course, we, well, we started with the viz. So right, vizql is the thing that is the key intellectual property of the foundation of Tableau. It's a description of the pills and whether they're aggregated or not, and whether they're sorted, and what fields are being emitted, and so on. That's VizQL, and somehow we got this query. And we do that in the, what we call the query pipeline using four steps. So we take the VizQL and we resolve it to an initial logical query. We simplify that logical query, we optimize it, and then we format it, mean, in this case meaning we generate SQL appropriate for the data sources that are involved. So let's look at resolution. So resolution, here's our viz again. Resolution is a resolving that vizql initially is about the inputs here. So these are the inputs, right? These are the fields from the data sources, and the stuff in the middle is the output of that query, in essence. 
So we're going to build our logical query starting from the data sources. So we have information on flights and their airports, and we're using an extract. So I'm going to build this logical query expression step by step, starting with this extract. I've got a calculation of arrival delay minutes. Seems pretty straightforward, but I've got a couple projects here. We'll come back to that. Uh, I've got a filter on airline name, and I'm going to add a select operator. So this is starting to sound a lot like relational algebra and a relational model, right? I have select where I'm filtering data. Typically, I'm projecting, meaning I'm selecting a subset of the fields from the extract or computing these calculations. And I'm aggregating the data. So here, uh, grouping by airline name and summing this calculation, and that's an aggregate operator. And also this logical query, which has other interesting properties of the query. So recall that the uh, bar chart was ordered by the calculation. Well, that information is in this logical query operator. And this visualization is actually just a static image of what you could, if you felt like it, take a look at from the Tableau log viewer. And you could interact with this, and you could uh, hover, get more information. You could click on these nodes and get more details about what's really going on. So I managed to build my logical query. And as I said earlier, the output is uh, this bar chart. But we're not stopping there. That's just really the first version. There's, even in this almost unbelievably simple viz and query, there's, there are simplifications that we can do. So very common to use parameters, right? Because I want to reuse calculations maybe uh, in a different way. So here I have a parameter, which is specifying arrival delay. And on this second project, I have actually the calculation that I'm doing. And it's conditional on the parameter value, whether I get arrival delay or departure time, departure de delay. And so I notice, of course, that my simplifier notices these things are the same. And so I can do inline substitution. That is a rule in the set of rules that the query pipeline rewriter has is this kind of inline substitution. And it also notices that these, this is a tautology. I'm comparing arrival delay to arrival delay. And that's always true regardless of the data. So I should be able to substitute a true for that. And then I can do something called conditional constant propagation, which essentially lets me eliminate that if statement entirely. And so I've simplified this down to just the arrival time delay calculation. And then I also notice that this parameter is no longer necessary, no longer referenced anywhere. And so I've removed that parameter. But not only did I remove the parameter, but I also removed this project that the parameter assignment was uh, associated with. So I, not only just did I simplify the calcs and the assignments, but I simplified the logical query. And that's like the simplest possible example you could imagine of simplifying these things. So we saw actually many, and even in this simple example, we saw expression inlining. We saw a constant uh, conditional propagation. Uh, we saw unused values removed. Uh, we saw redundant operations, redundant operators removed. Uh, we didn't see functions being simplified. So for example, let's say you might have some string function, let's say, where you are consistently using uh, 0, 1. And we know 0, 1 means uh, just sort of a specialized subset of that. Maybe it's the prefix of a string. Maybe there's another way, another function, or maybe a way to specify that uh, computation not even using a function. We could simplify that. And then a really powerful simplification that maybe I've seen in several of the talks that I've been attending uh, this week, removing unused joins, um, primarily where their tables are in a star schema of some, of some kind, and I have a, re a referential relationship. And uh, whether it's enforced or not, if you know that it, that it's, uh, that it is in place, then you should always uh, check assume referential uh, integrity, if you can, on the user interface. So why simplify? Well, mostly it's about performance. That's not too surprising. Um, we are 
really try, we're, we're dealing with a user interface, right, that's generating the, the VizQL is like a programmatic specification for something. It doesn't say how to do anything, right? We, we, we need to like get from there to something that our database understands. And, and that's not really as easy as it, as it might seem. So to get good performance, uh, to enable not just good performance, but predictable performance. So if I say specify a calculation, I can do that in a couple, several different ways in Tableau, right? I can do it with a pill and a dialogue, or I can just start from a calculation from scratch. I want, to be sh I want the performance of that viz to be the same, regardless of how you specified these operations. But even more than that, if you, let's say those two things, your two vizs aren't quite the same, your calcs aren't quite the same, your filters aren't quite the same, but in your mind, they're similar. We really like those things to perform well, right? We don't want you to fall off a performance cliff just because you added one more uh, calc somewhere. And then enabling caching is really important, especially for the simplification stage of the, of the query pipeline, uh, because as much as possible, we want queries, no matter how they're specified, to, to be the same so that when we look them up in the cache, we find them regardless of how you specified them. That's, uh, that's a really important aspect of simplifying. So now I'm going to move on to optimizing. What do we mean by optimizing? Well, optimizing, <clears throat> as opposed to simplifying and rewriting, it means rearranging the logical tree to be executed more efficiently. Uh, and usually that means to make it more simple, but it Turn, and simple is usually faster, but it's not always faster. So sometimes we do simplifications that work well in most databases, but not all. And we try to avoid special casing, but, if we, if, but we, of course, do. Uh, when I say we, I don't actually do the work. It's the query pipeline team. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so for example, uh, ordering the filters in a particular order might be advantageous, depending on what kind of filters they are. It might not make any logical difference, but it might make a difference to the particular data source that we're talking to. Um, probably the most obvious example of this kind of optimization, though, is uh, for cross-database joins. So what, what, we, what we refer to as federated queries. And that's the case where we have more than one data source. And so it's really up to Tableau to figure out how to execute that query across these multiple data sources. Like these data sources aren't going to do it for us. We have to decide. So we have to figure out which part of the tree applies to which data source, what order to run them in, uh, which filters to evaluate where, uh, and, and, uh, and so on. And so when to filter and aggregate the data is like a key decision that Tableau has to make. And we have a lot of flexibility, right? Because most of this functionality is implemented inside Tableau, uh, typically via Hyper, right? I mean, I can do pretty much everything that I can do in that I need to do for data in Tableau and Hyper. Uh, but uh, so I could in evaluate a filter in a remote data source, and this data source, or this data source, or maybe both data sources. Uh, I could uh, push functionality, let's say some kind of function execution into one data source, but maybe not the other because I know that that functionality is really slow in that data source. I have to decide how much data to move. Uh, so moving the least amount of data might not always be the best answer because maybe if I bring more data back, then I'll be able to reuse that data later uh, for other queries that could use that same data. So that there's a lot of trade-offs um, that might not be obvious uh, um, all the time. There's a lot of trade-offs that, that we can and do make. And finally, this fourth step, which is formatting. That's basically understanding the kind of SQL that these data sources support. And of course, there's, no, there's really no such thing as standard SQL <laughs> in practice, right? There's a standard, but not everyone implements it. And many people implement non-standard things that are actually really useful. Um, so, so ta and taking advantage of the functionality that exists in all these data sources is, is, is very important um, for performance. One of the data sources, of course, that we care most about is the data engine. And today, for most people, that's hyper. 
until Hyper was available, I think, in 10.5, then, of course, we had the previous incarnation of the data engine, which had its own query language called Tableau Query Language. But Hyper speaks a very common form of SQL, which is nice. Uh, Tableau Server, when, let's say, you have a published data source and you're talking to the server, let's say, from desktop, we don't actually generate SQL and send to the server. We actually send kind of this intermediate logical query form of the query, uh, which is sort of ready-made for the server, maybe to plug in the uh, data source uh, or and uh, you know resolve and go through this pipeline again. So in some cases, you might go through the pipeline on more than once, which is some interesting use cases there. And finally, MDX, uh, which you do support several MDX data sources. So we managed to format the query. This one was pretty straightforward. Here is another super simple example, but again, not so straightforward. I have this tableau calculation where I've been shown an ad, and, and uh, I want to know, some, was someone shown the ad, and did they purchase the item? In Postgres, because it supports Boolean types as a first-class type, that's a very simple translation to shown ad and bought. But in SQL Server, at least until maybe recently, uh, they didn't support Boolean types, so then we had to do this thing with integers, or essentially emulating Booleans with integers. And it's not as straightforward as you might think because we need to worry about the null semantics of, uh, of, of these quantities. So if either shown, add, or bought are null, then the output should be null, right, according to the standard. So we did manage to run our pipeline and we Started with VizQL in this example, because we started with a Viz, and we got SQL. And we still just support TQL, right? I mean, we didn't make you upgrade to 10.5, uh, to so we still <laughs> support uh, TQL. But, but mostly going forward, we're concerned about the SQL generation. And, uh, but it's not just SQL, as I said earlier. It's also MDX. It's also the server. On the, on the, that's the output. On the input side, it's not just the Viz, but it's also Tableau Prep. Uh, so Tableau Prep reuses all of the query processing that we built over the years in, uh, in, uh, for desktop and, and Tableau Server. Uh, and I'll show an example of some queries from Tableau Prep later. Uh, we also have command line interface internally, um, which we use for testing that uh, allows you to, to just provide these logical queries directly rather than going through visits. As you imagine, that might make some sort of data-focused testing easier, right, rather than going through the full stack. Uh, and also, uh, synchronizing or refreshing extracts or running queries. That's going through the same pipeline again. Uh, that's running Hyper again. Uh, and I'll show examples with Hyper later as well. So what do we mean by a query? So here I have an obscure quote by Mr. Ed. Mr. Ed is a character in a television show. He, Mr. Ed is a talking horse. The show is about the hilarity of, the, of what the talking horse has to say. And, and this, the, this show starts, the, there's, a, there's a jingle, the, the horse is a horse, of course, of course, unless it's Mr. Ed. So a query is a query, of course, of course, except maybe if you're really interested in the SQL that's running against my database, then that query is maybe talking to me. Uh, but all of, these, all of these are queries, and everything I, I showed here, even your viz, right, is a query in a sense. It's a, kind of a visual metaphor for the queries, the business questions that you're trying to answer, and a dashboard is answering one or more business questions. So maybe a more authoritative source, Dr. Codd, who founded the relational model, relational processing, is really about whole relationships as operands. And that's really what everything we've seen so far is, is really this sort of set operation, op, set level operations on, on data. And so the relational algebra from the relational model is a query. The input and outputs of the query pipeline are queries. The levels of abstraction between the VizQL and the SQL that ultimately I issue one or more SQLs that I issue against some data source or queries. Um, but then there's the remote data sources. So Hyper, of course, has its own <laughs> representation of a logical query, and all these other systems do as well. And they also have something called physical queries, which is basically 
taking that logical description of, of the question I'm answering and saying how to answer it. So it's not just about joins, it's about hash joins. It's not just about computing aggregates, it's, a computing about, it's about computing, say, sort-based aggregation. So it's, it's, it's physicalizing it. And of course, in Hyper, the most physical instantiation of that query is the code that is generated, right, through LLVM. We actually generate code. Uh, and so that program is, is a query. That's the ecosystem of query processing in Tableau. And so visually, what I mean by that, I try to capture this. This is challenging. Here's our platform. And a lot of what we're talking about, the pipeline, for example, is mostly about accessing the data, prepping the data, analyzing the data. Of course, it's all mostly driven through visas. And so this is a key part. This query pipeline is a key part of, the, of our query ecosystem. And if I shrink that down and start bringing in the other pieces so you can see them all together, then I'm just going to put the viz there. But that's representing, obviously, you know, Tableau prep. I could have put a bunch more stuff, but it's not going to fit on a slide and you won't be able to see it. It'll be too small. And, but all these uh, users of this query pipeline Participants in this query ecosystem are creating these logical queries, which we saw a really simple one. Here's a less simple one. Uh, and we're producing, often producing SQL, possibly for our own data engine, which today is Hyper, but not always. And Hyper has its own optimizer, right? It has a series of steps it goes through to do the kind of optimizations, but maybe more physically oriented, physically meaning how the data specifically moves in the system and also generating code. It generates a physical plan, which is like, it's not just an extract, it's a scan of an extract. Like that, that's really meaningful because let's say you're opening uh, a TDA-based extract in, hi in Hyper, right? I mean, that scan is a little different than the scan that you would get if you were opening a, opening a hyperized Extract. So that type of scan matters. And these, this, so this is a super simple physical plan. But I also have these other data sources. And, and, and they have physical plans. And they have optimizers. And then somewhere in here, there's a bunch of caching. <laughs> there's a lot of caching. And that is you know, its own talk, or maybe three. So that's, <clears throat> that's the, the crazy visualization in my head for what the ecosystem looks like. So now let's look at some queries. So we're going to go kind of back down. And what we started at a simple example, we went out to the ecosystem. Now we're going to come down and look at some specific use cases. We're going to look at how an example of how we make queries robust. We're going to look at a couple examples of how we optimize queries. Uh, we're going to look at some federated queries. So rewrites and caching, very, very uh, important. Uh, component of making queries have predictable, robust performance. And the join culling based on referential integrity constraints, I'm going to like take you through an example where you can see that happening. So here's our viz. I've changed it. I've simplified it. I still have flight information, but I'm grouping on airline ID because I know this data well. I don't, need, I don't need airports. I mean, I know these IDs like the back of my hand. So. If I use the Tableau Log Viewer, and now that's what you're seeing, uh, I won't teach the Tableau Log Viewer, but you can, I have a link to the wiki of the GitHub project, which does have some, a lot of documentation, some, some documentation. Uh, if I click on a log entry here, I can see uh, the query, and it's uh, like, if it's SQL, it'll be formatted, and here, this is the logical query. So this is the XML version of the visualization you saw on, like, uh, early slides that was logical query. I can visualize that from by clicking the visualize button, and I, now I see a query that looks a bit like what I saw earlier, and it's got 117 nodes. Now, if I look at that query after rewriting, then I've simplified it. It has 89 nodes. Now, what if I go back and add the airline table, even though I don't need it, but I think I'm going to need it you know, in the future, maybe. If I add that and then I come back here, I'm going to end up having a refreshed viz. Am I going to have to access all the data that I already uh, 
accessed from the flight information table just because I added this additional table? Well, I hope not um, because, but it, it's not looking good, right? Because here, not only do I have a query with a lot of nodes that has the flight information, but it also has this new airline table, it has a join. And it's not just that simple because if I click through that select operator, it turns out, remember that I had a filter on the right-hand side. Well, that table got added to the filter as well. So just adding these tables in, right, they can have a knock-on effect where the tables end up showing up in places that you might not initially think. The world is actually pretty complicated. And so I'm going to look very specifically at the query that's given to a rule that runs in our query pipeline that's, that is going to simplify this, uh, it's going to call this additional join, because I didn't, don't need it, right? My viz didn't change. I, I shouldn't need this table. So after that, of course, I did get rid of it, because it proved. It literally is a theorem prover. Essentially, it's proving to itself that I can remove that table without affecting the output. And so the version of that query after I'm done only has 84 nodes. And if I looked at the next uh, entry that showed whether I got a cache hit or not, it shows that I did, right? So I actually ran this and showed to build these slides. <laughs> and it really does work. Uh, I got a hit in the abstract query cache. So here's an LOD, level of detail cal calculation example, sort of just like adding tables. Like the LODs can kind of propagate <laughs> through, through your query. We'll see an example of that where it's really important wherever we can to take LODs that are maybe not always identical, but similar enough to be combined together so we don't uh, repeat a lot of work. Uh, we'd like to replace uh, the data access of multiple same or similar LODs with a single common source. So here are my viz. I've got the flight information again, but I've added a LOD calc, the simplest possible LOD calc, right? Compute the sum of arrival delay minutes at the highest level of detail. So I can always have this percent of total, which is always correct, regardless of the level of detail of the rest of my viz, this percent of total will be correct. And that is like one of the basic, most simplest use cases for level of detail. And I've also got a, a filter. Uh, and notice I have a slider-based filter, is that what it's called? Uh, for um, percent of total. Like, I'm only selecting the top half of the range. So, so that's also a filter. So if I look at that query, uh, it doesn't look so bad. Um, I forgot to mention I had a couple other tables on the uh, data tab that I didn't mention. I also have uh, city and state. Um, but if I expand that aggregate, um, uh, whoa, I'm, gonna, I'm seeing those same four tables again. You know, they're sort of off the bottom of the slide, but on the left-hand side, I'm seeing, seeing multiple measures. In fact, these are the measures being computed for the filter on the slider for the percent of total. So it kind of looks like I might be joining these tables at least three or four or maybe five times in here. I really need to simplify this. And so indeed, these are very similar for the most part, and I can mostly get rid of them and replace them with a single instance of joining these tables on the right-hand side. Uh, and uh, I didn't give you enough time to see, but the, these references to temp0 import and temp1 import are measures 0 and uh, 2. And you see those on the left being calculated uh, as uh, sums of arrival delay minute, minutes. So here is an example with temporary tables. Um, Tableau, the query pipeline, uses temporary tables, uh, for example, uh, in more than one use case, but this is about uh, large inlist. So if I have a really large inlist, I mean, in the past, uh, I've worked and seen queries where inlists might be, you know, a gigabyte <laughs> of inlist, like a database <laughs> in an inlist almost. Uh, so this is a really important, and some mature, Data sources will do this optimization itself, um, but not all. And especially these days, just imagine, I mean, every five to 10 years, there's another 10 databases. 
out there, right? I mean, the, the databases just keep coming and coming, and there's no way they all do all these optimizations. So it's important that Tableau do them. <clears throat> so here again, airline data, flight data. Uh, what I've done is been really mean with this filter. I selected every other value of um, city and state. And I'm trying to create something that no way can Tableau figure out how to, say, create a range predicate. Because Tableau will do this, this kind of stuff, right? If you have an in list and, and I know it's a, it's a you know, quantitative variable and I can do you know, greater than this and less, less than that, then Tableau will do those kind of things. But it'll be hard to do with this. So what do I end up generating for SQL? I end up with <clears throat> a very complex you know, or long list of of uh, city-state pairs in this in clause. And in some systems, this will perform very poorly. Just imagine if I sort of iterate over that list in the most naive way, right, one at a time. Or maybe I'm better, I do sort of binary search, but search through that list. But even, even that is slow, right? I should really be leveraging the join algorithms, which is probably where people have invested a lot of effort into matching two data sets together, right? Joins, and that's really what this is. So I'd rather join. And here's the version of that query where I've joined. So what I'm going to do is start there and then back up sort of from bottom to top from, from, um, <clears throat> from now to the past and see that uh, I've inserted that in list into this temporary table. Um, and if I back up again, I'll see the logical query. And the logical query, if I see this tuples operator, then that's my indication that the pipeline is going to use a temporary table. And uh, here's my query. And on the left, lower left-hand side, I see that tuples operator in the logical query. And then the final version of that is sort of shifted to the right and simplified uh, quite a bit. And this is going to result in that temp table processing that hopefully looks like this when we're done. Of course, that means we're creating a temp table on the data source. So it means we have to have permissions to create temp tables. It has to be space to create temp tables. Uh, and, uh, and we are uh, putting some data in that temp table on the, on the remote data source. So you should be aware of that. Federated queries <clears throat> or cross database joins, um, like one of the most obvious optimizations is to take predicates and push them to the data source. That's almost always the right response. Um, but the federated optimizer phase of the query pipeline, I didn't break the optimizer into its subphases, but there's a federated optimizer phase that assigns these subtrees to the data sources. Uh, and it leverages Tableau Data Engine Hyper to uh, consolidate the data, right? We need to bring these things together. So again, here's my flight data, very similar. Um, but in this case, I made life more complicated. I am, I'm actually using Hyper as its own data source here for the flight information data. And I put the airline and, and state data into uh, Postgres. So now I have a federated query or cross database join query. And somehow I need to bring all that right together because I'm, I'm joining this data. I need to, how, how and where am I, am I going to do that? So then here's what the query looks like when I first get started. Uh, there's those three tables. It doesn't really say, it's not clear where they are yet. I haven't really done any simplification or optimization, really, of this yet, right? Oh, I have all these projects and selects and aggregates on top here. But um, after doing some, some rewriting of the logical query, now I see I've pushed the sum selects, well, all the selects and the projects um, through the joins, right? That, that's a rewrite that, you, that is really important to do. And in, in some cases, maybe some of these selects might be actually duplicated. Like the, this version of the query might actually be, in some sense, more complicated than the original version. And so what, how does that really play out? So that looks, when it really, the, the closest you can get to seeing what's really happening is this version of the logical query, sort of the final version after the federated optimizer phase of the 
query pipeline. So this middle stack is the hyper data source. Um, everything that you see there is running in hyper, and you could, you could drill into these nodes and understand a little bit more about what's, what filters are really running and what, what's being projected. And the two on the right are uh, go, coming from Postgres. Um, potentially, they're both Postgres, right? And they're both the same instance of Postgres. So maybe there's an opportunity, maybe, maybe especially if I could find a join predicate between uh, these two tables directly, then I could combine them in a single access to that remote data source. But in this case, I have separate ones. Uh, and I'm creating some temp tables. And those temp tables are being created in Hyper, and the data is streaming from those remote, remote data sources into Hyper. And then you see those temp tables on the left being joined together. So those, those, that's the three tables and their joins. Um, and this is mostly how uh, we do federated query processing today. Um, certainly the default behavior is to always bring the, the data, to do as much processing on the remote but to, and to try to bring as little data as we can back. But it, we are bringing it back and we are putting it in hyper and then joining it there. There is actually a feature in a recent dot release that is something called Alternative Federation Engine, which in some limited cases, let's say you're joining a small file to maybe your warehouse, <laughs> might, be, but might be more performant to push the file to the warehouse than vice versa. But to use, it's not on by default um, because uh, Primary reason is that maybe you don't want that data on your on your laptop being put in in a uh, being moved to the warehouse <laughs> somewhere, right? So there's some sec potentially some security issues. So the functionality is there, but um, you have to uh, talk to someone to turn it on. <clears throat> so uh, I, I threatened you with a Tableau prep. <laughs> Earlier, here is the uh, Superstore sample for uh, Tableau Prep. Yeah, I think you can see that. And in this case, I've selected the quota plus orders join that is pretty much at the end. And you're seeing data, right? As soon as you select operators in Tableau Prep, it's running queries. That's something I didn't say. Like, not everyone gets it. Like, I think especially people who maybe don't understand the exploratory data analysis, the interactivity of Tableau. Every time you move a pill around, you're running queries all the time. Every sort of thing you're trying is, is, a, is our queries are running. So uh, it's true here as well. Anytime I select a node, uh, queries are running. Now, by default, Tableau Prep will try to use a subset of data, of the data, like some kind of sample of the data to make this interactive interaction really fast. Um, but I do have data, and I did run queries. <clears throat> and those queries can be visualized using the Tableau Log Viewer, just like everything else we saw. Um, here is the logical query for um, that, that ends, for the most part, with that join, right? I have a join, and also you see a lot of uh, top ends in here, and that is the how the, the default sampling is like the quickest possible sort of kind of sampling, which is just take the top end. <laughs> it might not be representative of your data, but it at least gives you some, um, some data enough to kind of understand and build the flow that you're building, and then maybe you can sample additional data later. Uh, and I, it doesn't really fit all on the page, so I have highlighted one node here, which is a join operator, and then if I, if I pan down in the visualizer, then I would see the rest of it. So there's a lot, there's a lot of joins, right? I mean, I had four inputs of files. Uh, there's some really interesting joins, like here's a left is not distinct join that is running in, uh, in uh, well, is, is being evaluated in the query pipeline and then ultimately uh, runs, usually on hyper. So you'll see like these, especially in this like sampling scenario, the data, I think the input were files. So files by definition go, immediately go into hyper and, and we're just taking top end. So these inputs the, of the extract are just uh, the, uh, those files uh, instantiated in hyper and you can also see that. 
And this is uh, 1,245 nodes for the next to last operator in a relatively simple flow. So you can imagine how um, involved this gets. So I'm going to briefly go and show you a few hyper examples just to show you like at least one, re one data source. Of course, it happens to be our data source. Uh, someday, I hope to show you this similar kind of information from other data sources and tie it all together. But here are, this, for example, the steps that the hyper-optimizer goes through. It starts with that un unoptimized plan. I mean, that is basically the SQL that was the output of my query pipeline given to hyper. Hyper took that SQL, parsed it. It did its own resolving of that SQL to its logical representation of the query. And that's the first version of this. So this represents a query as it's being refined from the initial version through unnesting subqueries, uh, especially correlated subqueries. We don't want to do iteration. We want to do that Dr. Cod, you know, set operand kind of manipulation analysis. We're pushing predicates down. We're reordering the operators to an order that we think is beneficial. And then we're mapping to physical, so join to hash join, aggregate to hash aggregate, uh, join to uh, specialized, a, a kind of join that knows that there's only ever one match. So once, once I get that one match, then stop. That, that's an example of a, of a physical uh, optimization. And finally, I get the final plan. Now, if I expand those plan nodes and go to the right-hand side, I guess it's this way for you. At the top is my unoptimized plan. <clears throat> The second one is a uh, unnested one. So this is TPCH uh, query two, which has a uh, subquery in it. So after unnesting, that looks a little different. And then I reorganized it a little bit in the third subtree you see um, in a way that I think is going to be a, a better uh, way to execute it. And then the next one, I start to see estimates, really tiny numbers, of the number of rows I estimate are going to flow through here. So now we're really talking like database optimizer, because this is the bread and butter of database optimizers, is estimating these intermediate result cardinalities. And I even get down into um, like really detailed optimizations. Like this is early probe is essentially like think in a hash join, OK, bear with me. In a hash join, I build a hash table on one side, and then I read the other side, and I probe the hash table for matches, and that's how I match things up. Uh, here, I'm reusing the hash table that I built for the one side. I'm reusing it on the other side because it's possible that many of the rows that I'm reading are going to be emitted by the uh, hash join anyway. So if I can emit them sooner in the pipeline um, before I do maybe another join or two, that, that will be beneficial. So that's an optimization that we do. Uh, so here's some hyperquery plans. This is uh, query one from TPCH. You can see I can prove it because it's scanning the line item table. It's got 3 million rows, so it's, not, it's a very small scale factor, but um, it is TPCH. Here's another query plan. This is the same query plan we just saw in the context of the optimizer, but rotated. Now data is flowing from bottom to top instead of right to left, just because I had to fit all that on the slide. And again, here's that early probe um, that's in here. Um, here's another example. So I'm sort of highlighting these crosslinks. So this is something that we added just in the last few days officially to the Tableau Log Viewers Visualizer. So generally speaking, we're laying these things out as trees in the visualizer. But there are certain data structures like that hash table that are being used in other parts of the tree. Here's, here's a query where we're joining a table to itself. And uh, but possibly we're applying some predicates. Maybe you don't see it here, but um, we believe that it's that we should really only scan uh, construct that table one time. So let's reuse it uh, using this explicit scan operator. Here, here's another example of that. This one's you know designed to for the wow factor. <clears throat> I have a lot of scans and I'm grouping by a lot of things, but it turns out that many of them are the same. Uh, so these are the kind of optimizations that, that we do at the level, at, at this level in the 
Tableau's query ecosystem. So earlier I had like over 900 nodes and I'm down to 730. And this is a very safe thing to do because number one, I'm reusing the result, you can't quite see it, but it's a table scan and then a, a group by operation, right? That's not going, so I'm not gonna have more rows than I originally scanned. It's only gonna be the same or less because I'm grouping. And not only that, this group grouping is a blocking operator in the query processing. So it's not like I'm spooling the results somewhere. It's already sort of built in to the processing of the group by, so there's very little, almost no overhead to reuse that. So what do we mean? <laughs> Now, now that I've confused you <laughs> completely, uh, what, do we, what do we mean by queries? Well, everything we looked at. For me, everything we looked at is, is, a, is a query in some sense. And, and we, so we started, with, we started with viz to query. Uh, we looked at the ecosystem, and then we, we drilled down into like several simplifications and some optimizations, including federated queries, we saw them, right? I mean, there's nothing like seeing them to, and, and the level of complexity, like it explodes. So the visualizer is designed to kind of simplify it for you. So you can kind of see the outline of things without being blown away by the, uh, I decided not to include the like 10 pages of SQL examples that I, that I could have included here. So the visualizer is nice that way. <clears throat> we also saw queries from Tableau Prep. And, uh, and also hyper optimizer and hy hy hyper query plans. So where, where are we headed with this? So, okay, I don't know if you figured it out, but basically you're you know, part of my research project. <laughs> An early project, one of the first projects I worked on at Tableau. It's not the only research that I've done, but it's kind of one that I'd like to come back to now and then. So what, what are some of the things? If you have ideas um, la later in the talk, You'll see my email, my contact information. You know, talk to me after the after this, or you know, send me mail if you have ideas. But one of the key things I think would be really powerful is to kind of tie. Mostly, what we've looked at is kind of the upfront processing, and not like what really happened. Like, what are the performance metrics? And also, how do those? What really happened? How does that compare to what I thought would happen? So just getting those performance metrics would be huge. And if I could really tie the queries all together, all those different queries, the lineage. I mean, this is lineage. This is like maybe you've heard of like provenance, you know, data provenance, data lineage. This is like the query lineage. I started from a viz, and I went all the way down through hyper. And, I, and uh, maybe I had superstore. Superstore dashboard runs more than 30 queries. So how, what was fast or slow about that dashboard? I really have no idea. I have Performance Recorder, which gives you something like this, right? I get events sorted by time, but I don't necessarily know on a worksheet you know, what, is, what is necessarily slow. And I don't get a lot of detail. I get the SQL. That's great if I want to try, if I want to do A-B testing with that SQL, with and without indexes, with and without materialized views on my data source. I can do that, but wouldn't it be cool to drill down? So this is an, this is an ad for Extensions API. <laughs> this is Extensions API using the Visualizer, the same one that's in Tableau Log Viewer. But wouldn't it be really cool if I could see the physical plan uh, for that query on my remote data source, whether it was Tableau or not? whatever system that was. So I didn't have to go over to that system, run, explain, analyze on Redshift uh, to get that information. That'd be cool. Another thing that'd be cool is like, let's take it up a level. So actually, as it turns out, I mean, it's not everyone uses or is even aware of the performance recorder. So what about feedback right on the viz? So here's my viz of GDP per capita versus the ease of do, doing business, and it has some interesting charts on the side. So what if, what if I could convey, now, now, now I'm not committing to anything, this is not on the roadmap, <laughs> this is a research project, <laughs> but what if I could convey um, like elements, probably more likely it would be the filters you know, that are problematic, but, but just for the sake of, of, of discussing the possibilities, <clears throat> 
What if I could tell you, well, this is not, a, this is, this is not challenging from a performance standpoint? And of course, it, it's not just about queries. It's also about you know, complex calculations and rendering. So there's more than just queries. But I'm coming from the query angle. So this, this is a technique. This is, there's, a, there's, a, there's a research term for this called scented widgets. These are widgets. And I've encoded a scent, if you will, which in this case, I've encoded them using colors. I've overlaid colors on top of these. So to draw your attention to annotate uh, widgets on, on the canvas. And so it turns out if color is meaningful, then here the way I typically interpret it, then green is good and red is not so good. And apparently uh, hours to do is taxes. Taxes are always challenging. And that's, that's, that's the part. If, if I want to start with uh, the part of this viz that's the most challenging, I should start looking at how I compute hours to do taxes. And with that, that's my talk. So I'd be happy to take questions. Before we get there, I just want to point out that uh, here are links to the query graphs and Tableau Log Viewer and the wiki. Uh, and uh, please, please fill out the survey if you have any suggestions of any kind. So now I'll take some questions. Yes? Which one? Oh, the links, yeah. Yeah, these, these uh, the PDFs and the uh, videos, uh, pseudo video of the talk, will should be available in a week or so. Yes? Sure, I, I think I have one of those. Uh, I guess my question is, well, um, <laughs> I don't know how to get there fast. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've seen that like on the community forum, like exactly what you're asking for. And the answer that I you see the community members give is, well, you just use their performance recorder. <laughs> but clearly, like it keeps coming up. Like people, people don't want people want it to be like as sort of I guess nice to use as Tableau is itself, right? Why do I have to go in another mode and record this stuff and and then you know figure out and and part of and part of, part of what you're asking for is, I think, that we don't really know how to do exactly, which is like associating the SQL with the thing that you care about on the dashboard of the viz. So that the lineage there, I think we don't, we won't always, we don't always know the lineage. Uh, I don't see any reason why. I mean, I'm not a UX, you know, UI designer, so, so that part of it would have to go through that. But, but I think one of the challenges is just knowing for sure exactly which part of, because we sort of, it's sort of one way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we start with Viz and, yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, I can, I can take that back. I mean, I think you're asking for just easier to get and uh, a sort of more helpful um, and possibly like uh, incremental kind of like what queries are really running here without having to put a monitor on my remote data source or running the viewer or running the recorder. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean the logs. Um, 
uh, for, I guess it depends on whether it's desktop or server. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. I think if you restart, I, so I, the thing I'm not sure of is when the logs are reinitialized, you know, when they're cleared. In desktop, they might be cleared when you kind of end all the sessions. Um, but if you had more than one instance of Tableau using a bus, bunch of extracts, uh, or you had one Tableau using a bunch of extracts, then the log entries should, I think, should be in, should be there, right? They should be in whatever log directory. Uh, they should all be there, so you should be able to do. In fact, that's one of the, maybe you have a response to his question, but um, <clears throat> that's one of the things like in the perf um, designing efficient work uh, workbooks talk, uh, the suggestion there is take the logs and put them in Tableau, because the logs are JSON, put them in Tableau, and then you can run like Tableau exploratory data analysis on the logs, and that might be, that might work for what you're looking for. Yes? So when you move from Tableau data extract to Hyper, did you have to rewrite a lot of uh, your products under the Tableau? Um, the pipe, you mean the pipeline part of, of Tableau? Exactly. Yeah, um, <clears throat> not that much I'm gonna go with. I'm, 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 in terms of the query processing, I'm gonna go not that much. I mean, in terms of the overall project, it's a very substantial investment. But the, but the query processing, not so much, and that's because, uh, because for many academic, you know, or open source projects, Postgres is like the thing everyone gravitates to because it's sort of the most mature and has you know a Berkeley license, so it's it's really the thing people go to. And so, while Hyper uses like zero percent of Postgres, like zero, Hyper is completely new from the ground up. It did start with a SQL language affinity for Postgres, and Tableau already supported. Postgres, so it wasn't that, it, it, if anything, it, it was probably more that some of the semantics, so Tableau has its own semantics for, for certain things. Uh, that makes sense in the context of a viz, but might not make sense for a generalized database, so if anything, it was more that Hyper had to implement certain things than the query pipeline. So, have a, oh, yes. Um, so, um, this whole pipeline of like intermediate SQL generation, um, all the examples that you showed, you were basically selecting cases right out of your um, you know, table discovery uh, connected to your database. Um, I just want to know uh, how, how, does this, how does this process differ if you're using HelpSQL? Uh, are you using oh. data source as opposed yeah. to like a pre plugin database? Yeah, I think I've been forgetting to re. Uh, state the questions. Uh, what's the deal with custom SQL? <laughs> yeah, custom SQL is custom SQL and uh, the pipeline doesn't really touch it. Okay. Because apparently you know, you know better than, than we do <laughs> what to do. So, so it's kind of hands off okay. on the custom SQL. Custom SQL is like a subquery. We don't, we don't, you know, we don't mess with it. We just pass it, we just pass it through. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And depending on what you drag, if you just drag something, let's say you couldn't have location dimensions, you just put the, the location name up there, it's just going to run a query against the Postgres database, right? It's not going to run a query against Redshift to see if you can select from the location table of Postgres. You're saying in the canvas if I drag a pill. Exactly. If you drag something, yes. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's I, I believe it will only <laughs> run a query against. Uh, that table. Oh no, now functions. Uh huh. 
<laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think that's an area that we're working on. Um, I see. Yeah, so the, so I think the I think the point you're making is be aware that the the you know current time uh, functions for your queries might behave differently depending on whether they're evaluated in a data source or whether they're evaluated in Tableau. And I, I think I think actually there is some work being going on right now, or maybe already happened. I'm not sure, but uh, I, I've definitely seen. I, I know that the semantics aren't like what we'd like them to be always, so uh, there's some investment. Yes? Um, typically better at the data source, yeah. I mean, if you, if you watch or maybe you saw earlier the designing efficient workbooks, I think that's the title. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the, one, of, one of the high level suggestions, right? Uh, if you're doing something with a data source over and over again, you know, like even even beyond just like the filters and like projecting columns and stuff, like create something special for that. That that's how you can really amp the performance. Is by, in that sense, you're sort of pre-creating the thing that you already wanted. In your case, you're just maybe pushing or executing filters and things. Maybe, maybe you're using a view to do that. Uh, and that's, prob that's probably good. That's probably better. Uh, there might be some optimizations that Tableau might be able to do that you're preventing if, if Tableau doesn't, is not aware. I would say most of the time that's the right answer, but it might not always be the best answer because uh, typically optimizers want, need, the, the more context they have, the better they perform because all these optimizations are synergistic, right? So if I don't know something, but most of the time, if you're always putting a filter and you, and you want to, or doing a join and you want to make sure that works a certain way, then like creating a view or something would be the way to go. And I think that's actually uh, our max time for the talk. I'll be happy to spend a few more minutes here and, and answer more questions. Thanks for coming. <laughs>